Hi Drito, it's the 28th of June 2020. Three months into the coronavirus lockdown at the moment, hence the beard and excessively long hair. But over the last three months, I've been spending a lot of more time with my parents and listening to their various anecdotes. And so I thought I would take this opportunity to interview my father, Partha Das, on his experiences in life and more specifically about his emigration from Kolkata to London, what, 45 years ago now. So as a uh, starter question, why did you choose to leave Kolkata? To be honest, um, there was no real reason for me to leave Kolkata. Uh, I had a, a, a very good life there, but there was a political situation that was happening at the time, which meant that examinations and education itself uh, was in huge turmoil. There was a Nakshalite movement, which was a kind of communist movement, and they were disrupting everything. And uh, since my father used to work for the airlines, he said, why don't you take a chance and go to England and see if you can do A-levels there. And really, the, I always wanted to. It was kind of an adventure for any young man to come and have a look at things in the West. And that's the reason why I took this venture uh, to really come and try out in England without really any afterthoughts or thoughts for the future. So how, how old were you when you came? Uh, I was just 17 at the time. I just finished my GCSEs O-levels. Actually, I did O-levels from India itself. My school, La Martinia, uh, used to enable us, allow us to do uh, O-levels of Cambridge. And uh, that's what I did. So I had Cambridge O-levels. And so I knew I would get a, an option or a chance to study for my A-levels if I uh, was in England. Where did you live when you came to London? <laughs> right. Um, initially, uh, the plan was that I would live with, a, uh, with one of my father's friends, whom I call Shunil Kaku. And he used to live near the airport in a place called Osterley. But... Uh, after a few weeks, I realized that, uh, you know, it would have been difficult for me to live there. So, I had, my father had another friend, his name was Nirmal Mukherjee, and uh, whom I called Nirmal Kapu, and he was a very jolly person. And he asked me to come and live with him in a, in a, in a Catholic international students hostel. So that was in North London, in Manor House. On the very first night, uh, Nirmal Kaku invited me to go and take a shower in the shower room downstairs, which I did. And as I entered the shower room, I saw everybody showering completely naked. I had never showered naked in front of anyone. So I said, no, I can't do this. I felt really shy uh, in, in, in that situation. And... Um, Nirmal goes, so what's wrong with you? You're a man, just go and take a shower, otherwise you'll never be able to take a shower ever then. So, uh, kind of under compulsion, I uh, went into the shower, but I, I was still wearing my underwear. I, I just couldn't take off my underwear. And so I showered in my underwear to the amusement of everyone else that was around. And when I looked around, they were you know, as they were born, I guess, <laughs> to put it mildly. And uh, yeah, that was my very first experience uh, at the hostel with all these various different people. How did you support yourself and your accommodation, your food and studies? And... Uh, as I said to you, I actually had about £40 in my pocket, uh, which was actually a lot of money, which my dad gave me because... To come out of India, you only got about five pounds because there was a very strict exchange rate at the time. So here I was, I was paying three pounds seventy-five a week for my accommodation at the hostel. So I had to earn that money. So they, because it was summer, and there was lots of jobs at birth that you used to come out uh, in, in Evening Standard at the time and Evening News, that was other paper. Then there was another paper called it, uh, 
Exchange and Mart and Dalton's Weekly. So I started to look up all of those, but I really couldn't find any jobs. I mean, I did call, and but they knew I was an experienced Indian. So I started to, um, with, with a friend of mine to Piccadilly Circus, and there was an advert saying, do you want to become a shop assistant? And to apply in St. Martin Street, which is where I went, and I met an Irish gentleman. His name was um, Mr. Riley, and he spoke with a really deep Irish voice. And although I could speak English, but his, it was difficult for me to follow him. But he offered me a job. He said, You can uh, work at MW shops on the weekends. Uh, and he said, where was my national insurance number? And I said, can you get me a national insurance number? And he laughed. He said, no, no, there is no way I can get you a national insurance number. You must go and get a national insurance number yourself. So I came back a little bit disappointed, not actually having a national insurance number. But Nirmal Kapoor asked me to go and visit the DHS's office in St. Anne's Road, which was in Haringey. I didn't know any of those places, but I did find out. There was no GPSs in those days, so... You just looked up in a book called A to Z, looked up the street, went to uh, the place, and waited in the queue. And I was interviewed by a really very old English lady. She was very kind and very nice. She said, oh dear, do you, uh, do you want to work in the summer? Have you finished your school then? And I said, yeah, I've just finished my O-levels. She said, oh, it's not a problem. I'll, uh, I'll, get, I'll, I'll, I'll write the details down and, uh, and you'll get your national insurance number within a week. But I'm giving you a card now with a temporary number and you can start work until the number comes to your, uh, where you live. Now, I was being wise because uh, you know, told me not to mention the hostel. So I just put down the address as 16 Portland Rise, London N4. And that's where my national insurance number eventually came, which I still retain now. And with the national insurance number, I went back to NW Shops. And he sent me down to Trafalgar Square, where I met a Mr. Morrison, who was the manager of the shop. That's how it started, and my pay was 44 pence an hour. And um, end of the night, day, at, the, at about 11 in the night, Mr. Morrison said if I wanted to do some overtime. And you know, I was just overjoyed. This is my first day and he's asked me to do overtime. I had something to write back home to my mother, say I, you know, I got overtime. My father actually asked me to join Walbrook College. I think that's what he had thought. But I went up to Elephant and Castle and I thought it was too far. So I uh, started to look for a college around uh, North London, uh, near Finsbury Park. And somebody advised me that Tottenham Tech was actually recruiting or taking uh, pupils to study animals. So I went up to Tottenham Tech and I had an interview with Dr. Pierce, who was the principal of this college. He looked at my grades and offered me straight A levels to join. So I was offered to do, to do physics, chemistry and biology. There were two liberal studies teachers. This is the class where you talked about anything from politics to religion to sex, if I may say so, uh, which is a subject that was that is never discussed in India. Remember, I mean, this is the 70s, so bell-bottom fashion, bell-bottom shoes, uh, trousers, long hair, dog collar was the fashion. And so I, my, my short hair uh, had now kind of become really long almost up to my shoulder length. After I had finished my A-levels, I did actually get a conditional offer to study medicine at Aberdeen. But having traveled there, I thought, my God, this is too far, too cold, and uh, opportunities for working in the weekend was nil. Now, I could have possibly waited one more year but I couldn't take the risk so in the very last minute you know as it happens I was still very young so there was somebody there who said why don't you try accountancy you get a job almost immediately so but I didn't really want to start writing you know going in without a degree 
So there was an advert to do a degree in accountancy at the North London University, and that's that's where I went. In those days, if you went if you went to university, you got a grant. I didn't because I was overseas, but most of the British students would have got a grant. So they're about losing nine thousand. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, I, I, I would have never imagined that students would actually not only not get a grant, uh, this was not a loan, this was a grant. Uh, on top of that, uh, you know, you have to pay for your for your tuition. Because, and, and the other thing about grant was that the grant was paid for the time when you were at college. And every time the college closed, you could go on unemployment benefit. <laughs> so, so you'd have regular income. Uh, yeah, I mean, so so finished for your college finished on thirtieth of June, and then you went on uh, unemployment benefit from June to September when your college opened again, and in September as you return back to college, you got your grant check, so you're never really out of money, and so students really had a fairly good time. But even then, I was just thinking a lot of students to complain the grant money was too low, so they were campaigning for more money. I think. Was probably a thousand pound a term or something, and here we were without any grant, working uh, on the weekends, paying for everything and paying our tuition fee, which is not a lot of money, but it was a lot comparatively because about two hundred fifty pounds a year. You were asking what jobs I was doing. I was still working for a W shop, but in the meantime, I became a gatekeeper of the London Zoo. There were a number of gatekeepers. They were really. Um, pretty old men. I was probably the youngest at the time. They took me through every nut and bolt of the job. But the most important part was the tea ceremony. There was a tea break once in the morning and once in the afternoon. And there was a hut where we all walked up to. And they would put a kettle on. There was no tea bag, or just loose tea. They hated tea bags. They would put the loose tea in the in a pot, warm the pot, pour the water. And, you know, I I used to think how much time we must have been <laughs> wasted, you know, because everybody went for a tea break. And then lunch was subsidized. There was a restaurant there which was for the staff members. You could actually have breakfast there too, and which was also subsidized. And breakfast used to be elaborate breakfast you could choose almost anything for about 30 or 40 pence so it was like double eggs bubble and squeak which probably you don't know about very much these days um, then there was fried bread um, and beans on, and, and oh yes and fried mushrooms most of the food was fried uh, and kippers and this is, uh, you know, um, is that fish. Or? It's fish, yeah, which had been smoked, and people ate those kind of stuff. And once you came out of breakfast, you didn't want a lunch anymore. <laughs> but people still went back for lunch, and for lunch you could have shepherd's pie, ravioli, uh, plenty of chips, uh, veg, carrots, boiled carrots, boiled potatoes. Uh, in swimming in gravy, so you know, all of that, and followed by a sweet, which would be uh, an apple tart with custard, all that kind of stuff. And every one of them said, you know, we, we support the National Front, I'm going to get rid of you at one point, and they sort of burst out laughing, and I, I was never too certain whether they were joking or they were serious, and also sometimes they used to say to me, you sure you did go to a public school? And I said, no, it's because you know your English is very posh, and I used to think here I am from Kolkata, working in London with white people, and they're calling me posh. That used to make me feel quite good, actually, to be honest. Did you did you face much prejudice against you while you were here in the seventies and eighties? To be honest, the if it was, if there was prejudice, it, um, I wouldn't have felt it because, you know, when I did my A-levels, I went straight through in my degree, 
I went straight through. A couple of times on the road when people uh, made stupid comments like, oh, I'm going to send you back or... Um, yeah, there was one lady, I was traveling from London to uh, Stoke-on-Trent and uh, she was speaking to somebody and said, oh, all these big dogs coming to our country. And uh, I, I felt quite small. I felt quite bad. But whether she meant me or someone else or what, I really wouldn't know. That was one incident. But to be honest, I have been mugged by black people twice. And I felt really bad about it because here I was, I always empathized with my black contemporaries. And yet the first time I was robbed at NWD shops with a knife held at my neck uh, was my black guy with a berry on his head. And then at Finsbury Park, I was beaten up by two black guys and he took my neck. I used to have a lovely golden chain that my mother had given me as a present. He told that off from me and um, so I felt a bit bad. However, on the other hand, the place I used to live, there was one uh, big black guy. He used to tell me, if you have any problem, man, I'm here to protect you, which he did. I probably felt it more in the professional life, you know, from people who were in power because when it comes to uh, promotions, I could see that they were promoting um, their contemporaries, the, the, the white people, I would say. But that was nepotism rather than racism, racism I would say. So uh, the, the line gets a bit blurred. Perhaps a bit more interesting. This is a photo of you. How old were you in this photo? Um, it was probably in my mid 20s, something like that. Uh, interesting stories. Yes, there's a lot of things that were interesting. Uh, you know, I had uh, never smoked in my life in the shop. There were two uh, Irish uh, ladies, girls who used to work there. And they used to smoke some of the cheapest cigarettes you could, you could get, Woodbines and Embassy. And they were saying, oh, have a cigarette. And I tried once and I felt so sick. I said, no, nah, I'm never going to touch this again. But then I came back home and, uh, you know, in the house that I used to share with Topunda uh, by that time, he was few years older and he was from Kolkata and a friend of the family and he had also come to study here and he used to tell me you look like a baby without a cigarette because don't forget it those everybody yeah, used to smoke see. cigarette and there was lots of adverts on cigarettes everywhere you went to the cinema there was adverts on cigarettes uh, billboards wherever you went and so if you didn't smoke it and people used to, the moment they met you they would offer you a cigarette and then you, you, you had beautiful lighters being advertised, nonsense lighters. They were, you know, pizza, electronic, this and that. And so it was like you always had a lighter, a fashionable lighter. You know, in those days, people used to not shower as much. It just, there was no facility for that. Uh, they used to have, most big houses used to have an ascot heater where, you, you know, and you, you used to put in money. So five pence every time and get hot water. The house I used to live in, there was the uh, old gentleman uh, with his wife and, and they used to live in one apartment downstairs and we used to live on the top. And the, the bath used to be on top of his bedroom, I understand now. And so one day I was coming out of the bath and he said, he looked at me, are you taking a bath? I said, yeah. You took a bath last night too? I said, yeah. What's wrong with you guys? You know, I have a wash when I go to bed with my wife and you guys take a shower every day. Why? You don't need to do that many times. Not only are you wasting your money, but you're causing a lot of noise for me downstairs. I said, what's a wash? He said, you don't know what a wash is? I said, no. He said, look, there's a towel. Dip it in water and you clean your underarms and the back of your neck. That's the wash. You do that once every every week or twice every week. That's more than enough for you. I said, I looked at him and I couldn't believe this. But really, that's how it was. The other thing that happened was in college, um, A-levels, first year. Um, you know, at the end of the term, they actually had a... Um, 
party, the, the college attended, you know, arranged it. It was at the Rainbow Theatre. And they said there will be a go-go dancer. So I was there. Now I'm seeing everybody dancing close up. I'm really surprised because I'm still 17. And there was no such culture in India at the time. And then this uh, girl, lady, in a very skimpy dress, gets up on the stage and she's dancing and she's called the go-go dancer. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm getting used to it. College life was the five days. One day, two days, I was working on the weekend. I also worked uh, for a little while as a security guard. Yeah, so that was quite helpful because it's what, what that did was I could work the nights. So I used to start work at 8 o'clock on a Friday evening and finish 8 o'clock in the morning. But with a night security guard job, you got lots of hours of freedom, meaning you didn't have to patrol every, 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 uh, every hour. So every two hours you had to go and patrol and see that the premise is okay. So then you want those the time between those two hours to read and study. Yes, that's good. I was going to ask, how did you, yeah, how did you balance your studying with all this? That's how I did well, it. And of course, there was also off periods. You know, so on a Wednesday, I might have just two lessons. Yeah. And then I used the rest of the time to do my homework and reading. And uh, I mean, it was tiring because you know, don't forget that I was to also do some of my own, my own cooking. And... I don't know, I just uh, used to love meeting people. So I would go to Nirvakabu's house, arrange with him for the pujo, help him out there. Yeah. Uh, Kolan Babu, he actually was running a club. So I would go and help him with badminton. I could actually play much better badminton here. So I got a kind of reputation for uh, badminton playing. And I also... You still have some of your awards here. <laughs> well, those, those came later. I mean, they were, they were quite in championships and competitions that I joined. Well, as a quick sign, where did you win this one? Uh, I think it was a college match of some kind. I can't remember now. Uh, and then uh, there were a few more that I won at the uh, Asian competition. And then, of course, when it came to vacation, I went to India. Yeah. So I spent a lot of time, a couple of months there too. And it was exciting because then I could give them all the stories from England. So, do you go on holidays anywhere else apart from India within the UK? I guess it would be quite difficult with the amount of money. No, no, uh, I did, I did. It was um, uh, even within that, you know, I was uh, I was uh, still saving a bit of money, and um, so an opportunity came up. Uh, my father was studying. He came, you know, because he used to have to study. And um, in England, you know, to get uh, his licenses for 747, for the jungle. And um, he had some holiday. So my sister came over and we went on a tour from here to um, Hong Kong, Tokyo, and um, uh, Singapore. And we came back. And then another time, I, during my college years, I took my mom and my two sisters because they were, they were, they were on vacation from here to New York. I was working for uh, an agency called Accountancy Personnel and I had a, 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 a team leader. She actually gave me the answer, which was a job in the housing department. So I um, applied for, for that job and they interviewed me and offered me the job. So I became their finance officer. There, there used to be a lady who used to work with me. It was a debt collector. Her name was Linda. She was Canadian. I remember her quite well. So she found a job in Hackney. And then she phoned me and said, look, why don't you join Hackney? There's a really good job going. And I think that would, it would suit you really, really well. So... I wasn't looking for this job, but when she mentioned that, I checked it up and it was a senior finance officer within environmental health. I applied there. I was offered the job as a senior uh, uh, accountant.
for uh, environmental help uh, in February of that year and um, my earnings are pretty good by now I think it's about 10,000 I was desperately looking for a flat got this job gave me the opportunity to go and look for flats I could get three times my salary so 10,000 33 or 11 and I found a flat for 36,000 it was in uh, Andrula Court, which you probably have seen. It's in Wood Green. In Wood Green, Lordship Lane. Two bedroom flat. I've just gone 31. And Ma was saying, do you want to get married? And it was kind of, I said, yeah, I need a companion now. So in April, I went to India and got married to your mom. It was a completely arranged marriage. We had never been introduced. Then, 32 years, 33 years later, I'm still there. How was it having my sister, Priyanka, with the first child? We wanted to um, stabilize our jobs first before we wanted to have a child. Mom got a job quite um, early on. She got a job uh, with the OPCS, which then became ONS, which is the Office of National Statistics. And she then worked for her. Mm, she yeah. Still, working still working there. Too. Yes, indeed. Once we had joint income, then we were thinking of selling the flat and buying a, a house. We bought the house in ninety one, and then she was born in nineteen ninety two. Uh, but she had to have a we. Your mother had to actually have a cesarean operation, and uh, at the North Middlesex Hospital. Do you think that your decision to move to London was? The correct one in hindsight. Do you know, I I am very honest with you. I have thoroughly enjoyed my life. I have no regrets. I went to a really good school. That's fantastic parents. I had a really good young life in India. My only regret is not doing medicine. You know, I think I would have been a good doctor. I think that that's Everybody thinks that they would be a great pilot or whatever. And I wish I had tried a bit harder uh, and taken a chance and become a doctor. But having said that, you know, I thoroughly enjoy also my accountancy degree. I earned a fair amount of money. I've had good health. I've traveled the world. I've got fantastic children. So no, I'm completely fulfilled in that way. And yes, if I had not moved out of India at the time that I did, I would have missed all of this. But on the other hand, if I had lived in India, which my sisters did, yes, all of the other opportunities. I would have other opportunities. Opportunities like staying in your own society. Uh, but don't forget, India was in a terrible situation at those days. 40 years later, it is a very different place than it used to be. So it all, it looked like that we were doomed in those days. This economy, there was going to be a revolution. There wasn't going to be anything. So it was the right decision at the time. And uh, obviously for me, I, I prefer you moving to London. And, <laughs> and to be honest, you know, with hindsight, I thoroughly uh, feel that it's great way. It was the right decision because you could go to Cambridge. Yeah. I mean, and obviously I didn't know at the time. It was my dad's ambition that you go to Cambridge. And, you know, I myself have been fairly successful. I've done everything that I wanted to do. I, and also be part of my Bengali culture. Okay, guys, so I think that's a good time to wrap it up. And do you want to do you want to end the video? I normally end with a uh, see you in the near future. So. Well, uh, see you when I'm 80. If, I, if I'm still around. <laughs> <laughs> With my grandchildren, hopefully. Then. Maybe. Thank you. Maybe. See you in the future, Trish. On the last day of the four years when we have completed it. Thank you.